I'm from the University of Otago and I've been the science lead for AF8 um, since 2016 when it started. Now AF8 stands for um, Alpine Fault Magnitude 8 and the Magnitude 8 is because we, um, at the science uh, of the fault, tells us that there's going to be uh, a future earthquake of about that magnitude sometime in the next sort of 50 years or so, plus or minus. Um, but anyway, what, we're, what I'm going to do is, is start off with a bit of background sort of information to help set the scene um, on earthquakes and why we have earthquakes in New Zealand. What, what's, what is it about New Zealand that makes it high risk for earthquakes? And so um, I'll start with the whole world. Let's just go big and look at the globe. And what we're looking at here is the tectonic map of the world. Um, all the little fly spots on here are earthquakes and they are all clustering around the, the, the boundaries between these big plates around the globe. So um, you can see, oh shoot, sorry. You can see lines down here, for example, right around here. That's one tectonic plate there. And around here, you can see around Australia. <coughs> but actually, if you look at the Pacific area, which is most important to us, oh, that's a bit slow. Um, the Pacific Rim goes all the way around the America, you know, North and South America, all the way over to Japan and around down around our part of the world. And that's called the Ring of Fire. And that's where about 85% of the world's earthquakes and volcanoes happens. It's a very busy place for um, seismic activity. And when it gets to New Zealand, um, it goes off the coast here, and this is where the plate boundary goes right through the country. And so um, it's off the coast here, we've got a subduction zone, and on the next slide I'll show you what that means. It means that the Australian, the, sorry, the Pacific Plate, which is out to the east of the North Island, is diving down underneath the North Island. And when that plate dives down underneath here, it starts to get a bit hot down there as it gets deeper, uh, there's a bit of pressure down there and it starts to melt the rocks. And the, and the magma rises up, and that's why we have the volcanoes up in the middle of the North <coughs> Island. <coughs> so that's that's a subduction zone here, and then actually off the off the southwest coast we've got another subduction zone, and but this time the Australian plate is diving down underneath uh, the South Island. So we've got these big things happening, but they're moving in different directions, and then in between here we've got the Alpine Fault linking those two big uh, subduction zones together. So it's quite a complex uh, place that we live, and that's why New Zealand is the beautiful country that it is, because we have all these earthquakes lifting up the landscape and volcanoes and all those sorts of exciting things happening to make the landscape as beautiful as it is. And this here is um, the National Seismic Hazard Model. This is uh, the science that helps us understand where earthquakes are likely to happen in the future. And you can see these orange and red colours. Um, they mark the areas that are the highest risk for earthquakes. And of course, that's exactly where the plate boundary is. So the plate boundary is where we expect to have uh, the, the, worst, um, the most activity in terms of earthquakes in the future. So what does that mean, mean for New Zealand over the years in terms of earthquakes that we might have had? Um, this is a chart that goes all the way back to 1840. Sorry, you can't see. Can you? Can you see? Okay. Um, 1840 um, here, going up to the present day, and then up on this side, it's just the magnitude of earthquakes greater than magnitude 7. Sorry, I'm not going to keep moving around because someone's recording tonight. Um, so just the earthquakes bigger than magnitude 7. And the biggest one we've ever had was the Wairarapa earthquake in 1855. And then um, probably one of the, the, the most famous earthquakes, I suppose, for New Zealand was in 1931. It was the deadliest earthquake that we've had. It killed about 258 people. Some of that was ground shaking and the masonry buildings falling in Napier, but it was also partly related to a fire that broke out um, as, a re as a result of a gas leak, and there was a lot of fire through the city as well. Now, around this time, you can see a bit of a cluster of red stars of earthquakes, bigger than magnitude 7, from 1929 in Murchison, there was a big quake, through to the mid-40s, um, this cluster of earthquakes happened, some of them caused quite a lot of damage, like the Napier earthquake, and New Zealand at the time, we didn't have a lot of money, and, and rebuilding was quite costly, and we couldn't afford it, so about this time they set up the, the War Damages, Earthquake and War Damages Commission. Um, it was also, also partly because of the war, and they were concerned about having to pay for you know, um, war damages as well. So that's what the EQC started out as, 
And then later on, of course, they dropped the war damages part, and the Earthquake Commission is still carrying on now. Then uh, we had some other earth earthquakes. Hello, Alana. Sorry, here we go, it's working again. 1968 in Angahua. Who remembers that one? Yeah, that was quite a decent shake up in, around Murchison. And then Resolution Island, Resolution Island in 2009. Does anyone remember that? Yeah, down in Fiordland. It happened down in, um, around Secretary Island, Resolution Island somewhere. Yeah, it was a big sized earthquake, 7.8. But in between these two, we had about 40 years of not a lot of earthquakes. So we got quite complacent as a society. We didn't really worry about earthquakes. We forgot. And, and basically because a couple of generations went by without any experience of, of earthquakes. <coughs> and then Darfield in 2010, that kicked off the earthquake sequence in Christchurch. That was a 7.1. The, the earthquake that came straight after that, that did most of the damage to Christchurch, was a 6.3 magnitude. Doesn't even feature on this chart. Um, it was just such a shallow earthquake and right underneath the city, that's why it did as much damage, even though the magnitude wasn't that high. And then, of course, the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016. So we've had a busy sort of uh, phase again around here after quite a few years of not very much, which has made, made New Zealand get, get back on track, I suppose, with earthquake um, <coughs> risk reduction, trying to manage that risk and do better. And that's kind of when AF8 came around. So this was in 2015 and 2016. Uh, there was a lot of awareness of the fact that this big, long um, fault, which begins here off the coast of Milford Sound and it makes its way all the way up the western side of the Alps to um, Springs Junction. It's about 600 kilometres long. And our um, civil defence and emergency management groups around the South Island were very aware that this earthquake was likely to happen. And when it did happen, there'd be a lot to do, and emergency management groups knew that they were going to have to work together uh, and coordinate so that they could um, effectively respond to this earthquake. And so AF8 was set up to, um, to try and coordinate that effort, and I'll tell you more about that later. So, um, oops. so this is the Alpine <coughs> Fault, and this is the guy that first discovered it, this guy Harold Wellman, <coughs> who was a geologist who spent a lot of time on the West Coast um, in the 1940s and 1950s, exploring, uh, mapping the geology, looking for gold and other minerals at the time. He was quite a, sort of a, a, an innovator. He, he thought outside the square when it, comes to, when it came to geology because he uh, spent a lot of time looking at the landscape and he realised there was a big sort of linear feature down the west coast. He could see it in the rocks, there were different rocks on each side of the fault and he proposed a big long fault line back in those days um, and he called it the Alpine Fault in the late 1940s. And he went further than that. Um, he observed these rocks here. So look, there's a rock type there and it pops up again here in northwest Lake Nelson. It's actually a red kind of a rock. It's called, we call it the Red Hills. Um, it's actually called Ophiolite, which is a weird name for a red rock. Um, and what he observed was that these rocks were exactly the same and he proposed that once upon a time, many millions of years ago, these rocks were actually right across the fault from each other. So if you can imagine, if I go back to the last slide, that these were actually together right across the fault and they had been moved apart by earthquakes over millions of years. So just, you know, inching their way apart. Um, and now they're 800 kilometers apart, in fact, right up there. So these red hills, you might have seen them yourself down in Fiordland. Um, <coughs> sorry, it's not like there we go. So there are the red hills tucked in there in the Fjordland area. So yeah, he proposed that not only was this, that there this big fault, but that the earthquakes had been happening and it had been changing the landscape and moving the landscape. And that wasn't something that anyone could imagine back in 1940 and 1950. This was before we even knew about plate tectonics and the fact that plates were actually drifting, you know, moving across um, the planet. So it was, yeah, it was pretty... Uh, audacious kind of thing to, to, to suggest was happening. But he was right. And um, this is a pretty um, difficult slide to see in this kind of light, but you can see this is the Alpine Fault. It's a very straight line right down the west coast. And what's happening here where these two plates meet is that the Pacific Plate is coming in and it's kind of sliding past the Australian Plate, but also squeezing the Southern Alps together. So it's, it's actually sort of coming in and squashing the South Island 
squeezing the Alps up, and that's why we've got the Southern Alps, there's a squeezing, squeezing up motion right across uh, the South Island. <coughs> and um, that this is happening at about the rate that your fingernails grow, so about 30 millimetres a year, but it's not actually moving gently along at that rate, it's actually locked up, the Alpine Fault's not moving at all. It's storing up that energy, and then at some point in the future that uh, energy is going to be re released as an earthquake. So how do we know how this uh, fault has happened, how, how this fault has behaved in the past? Well, there's lots of different types of evidence from the field. One of them is, is tree rings. So when a tree gets shaken during an earthquake, it damages the root system, and it means that the tree has a slow growth year that year. And there's a lot of um, evidence from trees right up and down the west coast that tells us the last big earthquake, the, the last big forest disturbance, was in 1717, and we see that also in some of the uh, landscape features. So this is a little um, scarp here uh, along the Alpine Fault. And this guy here, is, he's dug a trench across the fault and he's done some radiocarbon carbon dating of the material down in there. That tells him something about the age of these um, past events as well. So that, these are pieces of evidence that are all pulled together. So back when I was doing my degree back in the 90s, and this, this chart here is showing the present day with that red blob and then we're going back in time 8,000 years. When I was studying geology back in the 90s, we knew about three earthquakes that had happened on the Alpine Fault. There was the 1717 earthquake and then a couple of other ones. But uh, about 2010 or 11, there was some new science and they discovered some really cool um, sediments down in South Westland which helped us to understand much more about the way the faults behaved in the past. So it was at this place called Hakuri Creek. I'm not sure if anyone's been there. The creek flows out here, um, out of the hills, on a good day when the battery's working. <laughs> there we go. Um, and, but when, when there's an Alpine Fault earthquake, there's a bit of uplift and the river then sort of gets dammed up. And because you've shaken the hills, a lot of uh, like gravels and silts coming out off the landslides that are created by the shaking, comes down the creek and it starts to accumulate in the bottom of that creek and then we, we get, a, over the years, a build-up of these sediments. It's pretty, pretty cool. We can see some of them here, those stripes of sediment that's showing these pulses of sediment that come out during earthquakes and collect in the bottom of this creek. Now most of the time those, those creek beds are just washed out by floods and things like that over the years, but for whatever reason they were preserved here. And by dating uh, the sediments, finding little leaves and things in those sediments and dating them, we've actually ended up with um, a big long sequence of earthquakes over the years. This now showing 70, uh, sorry, 27 earthquakes over the last 8,000 years, which for the even the untrained eye you can kind of see that these are happening regularly through time. <coughs> they're little histograms showing um, the, the wider ones showing more uncertainty in the dates, but as you can see, they're really popping off almost like clockwork through time. Um, amazing, amazing record of um, earthquakes going back. This is a unique kind of piece of science. There's very little science like this on active faults around the world, so we're very lucky to have it. Some other um, science was done actually a couple of years ago, which helped to basically reinforce what we, what we learned from that other data set. This time it was from lakes, so um, so scientists went to some lakes along the Alpine Fault and they drilled down into the base of the lakes. They got core samples out. And um, this is our colleague Jamie Howarth out, out there on his boat doing uh, the sampling of the lake bed <coughs> with all his te uh, technical equipment. Oopsies. And here you can see, you might be able to make out those same stripes of sediment coming out of those cores. Again, searching through those uh, deposits, you can find pieces of leaves and, and wood that you can date. And essentially, this, uh, this uh, data set also just basically reinforced what we already knew, uh, which is that the Alpine Fault has this very long history of producing earthquakes going back in time, and that there's really no reason why that should stop happening. It reinforced that the last earthquake was in 1717, and that they're happening roughly every 250 to 300 years through time. Um, the most significant for us is that there's a, a probability of 75% that this earthquake is going to happen in the future, in the <coughs> next 50 years. So that really puts it within the lifetime of most New Zealanders today. 
Um, so that's uh, pretty pretty solid evidence of the re and it gives us really good reason why we need to build our resilience and our preparedness for, for an earthquake like this. So how do we do that? AF8 is um, you know came around to really help to develop our preparedness as a society. So as I mentioned, it's a partnership between civil defence and emergency management groups right around the South Island. There are six of them. Um, and in partnership with the science community, there are about 30 Alpine Fox scientists that have at some time or other fed into the program. Um, and also community engagement. So we've done lots of events like this, um, talking to communities, but also talking with lots of agencies and ministries and embassies and basically whoever wants to listen to us, we'll talk to them. Um, so it's been a, quite a busy few years of, of talking about this because it's really important. <coughs> and so yeah, it's a really nice collaboration between people in research and in policy and in practice coming together and bringing all of their, you know, uh, their knowledge um, together to help us deal with quite a tricky problem. So you're probably wondering, what is, why do we need to be worried about the Alpine Fold anyway? What, what does it mean? What's going to happen? What might it look like? So the next few slides will help us to understand that. But before we launch into that, I just want to touch on a couple of terms that I'll be using, and I've been using magnitude quite a bit already. What does magnitude mean? Well, that's the amount of energy that's released by an earthquake at, at the epicentre, or where the earthquake starts. So the seismic energy that radiates out from uh, from the point of origin where it starts off and that's quite a it's quite a complicated um, scale it's actually logarithmic which means that every point two of an increment up that scale is doubling the amount of energy that's being released by the earthquake so for example we had the Kaikoura earthquake and that was a, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake and then the earthquake we're talking about here as a magnitude 8 well that's actually double the seismic energy uh, being produced by that uh, size of an, an earthquake. And the damage um, is worse right around where the earthquake's happening or where the, earth, where the fault actually breaks right through to the surface, where we, we call that the rupture. Then intensity, well that's something else, because you know intensity is more related to the damage that an earthquake causes, the ground shaking, how that actually affects us, our, our homes, <coughs> our property, infrastructure, roads, etc. So that's measured on the modified Macaulay scale, you might have heard of that. Um, it goes right up to, from 1 right up to 12 on this um, Macaulay scale, and 12 is, is total destruction, and uh, 1 is really not being uh, felt at all. And with intensity, it really depends where you are. So we could have an earthquake on the Alpine Fault, and because we're way over here in Belclutha, we're going to have far less intense shaking than, for example, if you're in Milford Sound. So your property won't be very badly damaged compared to areas closer to the fault. So the intensity of shaking and the intensity of damage will be much less here than, than elsewhere closer to the fault. And here's an example. This is an intensity model. It's like a, the footprint of damage, I guess, uh, that, that is going to happen after, well, not going to happen, may happen, because this is a scenario earthquake. It's just a possible uh, future uh, hypothetical, I suppose, of what might happen. It's the best uh, guess in terms of the science that we have on the Alpine Fault. And these different colours, this is the Macaulay intensity scale that I was just telling you about. So very destructive shaking up here and the red colours down to sort of only just being observed or not, very, not felt very much at intensity sort of level 4. And you can see right down where we are, we're looking at the largely observed, you're going to feel it, uh, but it won't be particularly damaging down here. And of course, the worst damage is going to be on the west coast, and this, given this, this particular scenario. Here's another one. Uh, here, sorry, I forgot to mention this white blob here. That's where the earthquake begins. So the, in this scenario, the epicenter is right up there in the north, and the energy is being pushed down to the south, uh, southwest. In this one, <coughs> we've got this uh, earthquake beginning around the glaciers, and the energy is going out in both directions. And you can see a slightly different kind of pattern of the intensity colours across the South Island, but this, the message is basically the same, that all of the South Island will feel this earthquake, the damage is going to be worse around the Southern Alps, right around the fault itself, but in this scenario you can see more intense shaking in the upper part of the South Island. Now this is actually the model, it looks pretty much the same as the other two to the untrained eye, but essentially this is the one that we went with, it's called the South to North 
a rupture scenario. And you can see here the earthquake starts in Milford Sound and it goes up and it pushes most of its energy up, up to the north, the northern part of the South Island. This one is the one we used to um, inform our planning that we did with civil defence. Uh, we created a planning framework after a couple of years of work and that's still being used today and it's a, it's a good, um, helpful guide for how we can coordinate effort uh, in responding to this thing in future. So anyway, this is um, a visual sort of animation of what that earthquake looks like. So you can see the little spikes starting off here and the time starting to tick away as this earthquake begins down in Milford Sound. Now, of course, those spikes are exaggerated. The, the whole island isn't going to shake like that, but it's indicating the sort of um, in intensity of shaking on this kind of scale down here. So similar, the reds and the darker reds are the most intense shaking and the lighter ones uh, are less, less strong. And as you can see, the wave front, as I'd call it, is moving mainly up the, the fault itself. Um, after a minute and a half, it's kind of got, got to the glacier towns. And you could maybe have seen the, the waves going across eastern Otago and out to the coast, but they were pretty small compared to the seismic waves going up that way. Um, now it's heading through the Canterbury Plains, and you can see in Canterbury, um, they have very deep sediments, so lots of river systems have, have been working their way across those plains for thousands of years, so it's almost <coughs> acting like jelly on a plate, those sediments, they sort of, um, they tend to bounce around the, the seismic waves under the plains there. So after three minutes, this earthquake's now the, uh, starting to send its energy up into Nelson and Marlborough, and then it'll go across Cook Strait and be felt in the lower North Island and across most of New Zealand, actually. Um, so yeah, this is a, it's quite a, a confronting kind of animation because it shows you that this is a big long fault. It takes time for the, the, the seismic energy to sort of radiate right out across it. It takes minutes, actually, and um, that this is going to be felt really widely across the South Island. So what kind of damage might we expect from that kind of shaking? So here we have the state highway network and with that intensity model kind of overlaying and you, and you can see some of these colours, the oranges and reds down State Highway 6 on the west coast um, through Arthur's Pass and in fact across all of the, the main highways across the Southern Alps, so uh, the Milford Road, Haast and Arthur's Pass and the Buller Gorge as well, all with oranges and reds showing that the intensity of shaking is going to be significant and we're going to end up with quite damaged sections of highway in those areas. Likewise with bridges, so this is again showing the shaking uh, and, and the, poten the potential for it to be damaging bridges and again those west coast bridges are the ones that will be getting hit with the most significant shaking. Uh, Waka Kotahi is doing a, a sequence of um, resilience work on the bridges on the west coast and they're making their way through those and upgrading them to, to make them withstand the shaking um, a lot better. So that's that's promising. Um, so often we think about earthquakes as the, the, sh the ground shaking and when it stops you sort of feel relieved and then, then what happens after that? Well actually earthquake hazards are uh, what happens after that because when the ground shakes things then kick off and there's a sort of a domino effect of one thing leading to another. And I'll give you an example of that. So the ground shaking um, in this example might lead to and will lead to landslides up in the, the high Alps. So right up and down the southern Alps we're, we're likely to get a lot of landslides. And we saw that in the Kaipolda earthquake. You know, there were tens of thousands of landslides after that earthquake. Now some of those landslides might cross river valleys on the west coast especially um, and basically dam the river, a river up. So here we have what we call a quake lake and it forms in behind a landslide and then it accumulates as the river flows into that and the, the, uh, the level of that lake rises up. Eventually most of these dams will fail and sometimes they fail within a day or so, sometimes it takes longer. But the next thing that might happen in that sort of cascade of, of hazards is the, an overtopping of the water and it flooding downstream. So that's just one example of a sort of a hazard cascade and there are many other different sorts of hazards that we need to be thinking about. For example, um, aftershocks, now that's a secondary hazard uh, caused by a main, a main event and they will rattle on for quite a long time after an earthquake of this size. Um, other things like tsunami, so we 
probably remember the Boxing Day tsunami in 2003. An earthquake led to the uplift of the sea floor and the tsunami then was um, actually the most, most deadly aspect of that earthquake. Um, what else? Liquefaction. We rem remember seeing that in Christchurch, a lot of liquefaction. That's also a secondary hazard caused by earthquakes. And fires is another one. So, you know, when we have these big earthquakes, we have to be thinking as well about the other types of things that can happen after that. So this is a model of what a landslide uh, distribution might look like. So, um, uh, not surprisingly, very high likelihood of landslides in the, in the Southern Alps um, as a result of the shaking. And then you can think about, okay, we're going to have lots of landslides. What does that mean for our infrastructure? So here we have the road network overlaid with that landslide model. And again, you can see those orangey red colours, mainly down the, the west coast and through the alpine passes, where landslides will go across highways and cause disruption like that as well. So access along those sections of road will be very, very compromised. And in fact, the west coast um, and, and into south Westland is going to be isolated for period, you know, quite some time while repairs are, are made. Uh, we saw 13 months of um, closure of State Highway 1 after the Kaikoura earthquake, and that was really just a couple of really massive landslides that caused most of those headaches, and, and there'll be a lot of that happening around the Southern Alps as well. So that's something to think about, and what that means is, you know, obviously it's going to change the way we move around the island, the way we deliver goods and services, the supply chain, the things like that will, will be disrupted for a period of time. This is the same landslide model, but this time we're looking at the electricity distribution network. So uh, this is the way we move power around the countryside. And you can see a couple of pinch points there, mainly through Arthur's Pass, um, that just simply because if the pylons are damaged through there, it's going to be really difficult to make those repairs because the, land, the landscape is very um, uh, unstable. You're going to have a lot of aftershocks. It'll be tricky to get in there and fix things. And on Tuesday night, we were actually up in Omaru talking um, to, to a crowd up there, and we were lucky to have a Meridian Dam engineer in the crowd. And um, during the Q&A, lots of people wanted to know about the hydro system and whether they were safe and, you know, obviously living in the Waitaki Valley. And he was able to answer lots of questions, which was fantastic. Because obviously the Waitaki um, hydro scheme is really critical to the way we deliver uh, power across the whole country. And if... Um, if they're shaken enough, those dams go into automatic shutdown and they need a, a black start to, to, kick, to, to start up again. And in order to have a black start, they need power. So if you have a, a sort of a, a power outage, it might be quite widespread, even though down here we don't have many direct impacts from the earthquake shaking, the, you know, the d distribution of electricity might be uh, disrupted for quite a wee while. <coughs> And then of course you've got columns of people and you know communities being isolated, um, particularly on the west coast with the bridges perhaps being um, impassable, communities needing to look after themselves for, for a period of time. Um, also tourists, we you know we've seen this quite a bit with tourists kind of getting getting caught up in the in the chaos I guess of these events and needing to be taken uh, taken out and evacuated back there um, either by sea or by air. So there's quite a lot to think about in terms of. Um, getting people out of communities because often, you know, there are just small populations having to look after thousands of people. It's really tough uh, to do that. So I'm wrapping up with just a couple of slides just to think about the, the situation in Balclutha. What, what does it mean for you guys down here? Um, and that's a lovely slide of your lovely town in the autumn, I think. So I've put a wee dot on the map here. You can see yourself. I think that's about where you are. I didn't check the map, but I'm pretty sure that's about right. <laughs> Um, so you're sitting down in the, um, the kind of four, intensity four or five, the Kali intensity. So what does that mean? What, what sort of shaping does that look like? And that's one of the other scenarios. So in both cases, you're looking at sitting in around the, 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 the fifth, the five kind of intensity. So what, is, what does that mean? This is the de definition of um, intensity five. So we've got people, um, uh, the earthquake is felt widely uh, by people outside and by almost everybody indoors. Most sleepers will be awakened and a few people uh, will feel alarmed. And then inside your house, the fittings uh, and things, uh, some small um, unstable objects are likely to be upset. Some glassware or crockery might be broken, hanging pictures knock against the wall, doors swing open, cupboards might uh, open, and pendulum <coughs> clocks might stop. 
Does anyone have a pension problem? <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the time might go out, so that's really in inconvenient. And then structures, some type of specific kinds of um, structures might, uh, windows might be cracked and, and toilet fixtures might be broken. So the, this is the definition, right? So what, what this is telling me, and I'm, I'm sure you feel the same, is that it's not going to be major here in Balfreath. You're going to feel it, there'll be some things moving around inside, it won't be significantly damaging. And that's all, that's all good news. Um, but what it also means, and we've got to think about the wider imp implications of this, is there'll be indirect um, implications for you. So as I mentioned, with the roads being disrupted, that means supply chains will be difficult. There might be power outages that last for a while. Um, so essentially it means we as, we as communities need to be thinking about looking after ourselves and our neighbours and, and others in our community. And that is all about being prepared and getting, um, having a chat about it with your neighbours, talking about it with your workmates and maybe in your workplace um, and getting a few plans in place. And that really does make all the difference at the end of the day in terms of um, how we come through this together. And um, well, my, my mate Jason at the back, most of you will know Jason, I'm sure. Um, it's great to have a guy like him with deep connections to your community in this emergency management role now. And you know, over the years I've been involved in AF8, I've really grown to respect emergency managers so much because they do a lot on a very small amount of resource. I think when we started AF8 back in 2016, there were like eight emergency managers, like full-time staff for Otago, all of Otago. Um, it, that's grown to about 18, 20, 20 something. Yeah, um, so there's more, but I think from the public perception, people think civil defence is just going to roll up and help them and come over the hill on a white horse and things when things go wrong. But of course, that's not possible. There aren't enough people to do that. And so it's on us as, as people, as individuals, as members of our community to, um, to get prepared. And you know, as part of the roadshow, we go into schools and we talk to young people about how they might um, talk to their families and do some planning at home. It doesn't have to be too stressful or too much. You don't have to become a massive prepper or anything like that, but it just pays to have a bit of, um, a bit of uh, do a bit of thinking at home about what you would do. Um, and this is also not just about earthquakes, of course. All sorts of disruptions are happening around New Zealand, as we've seen lately. So if you're prepared, prepared for an alpine fold earthquake, you're going to be prepared for lots of other things as well.